And um, tonight and next Thursday will be, next Thursday will be my last class on the tabernacle. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> and last Thursday we really had a lot of people missing. So I'll, I'm going to cover a little bit of <clears throat> what we've gone over and try to catch you up. But basically, of course, the basic premise that we've been going down is this premise that's on the board, the difference between the tabernacle and the temple. And the, the dividing point between the history of the tabernacle relationship with God and the temple relationship with God is the cross. And we've said that Jesus tabernacled among us. We get that from John 1.14 in the original Greek. And that relates to the fact that Jesus came as the fulfillment of the Old Testament tabernacle. Now, the way a lot of Christians think of Jesus fulfilling the things of the Old Testament is more like this. They think <clears throat> Jesus came and did away with the Old Testament <clears throat> um, and by fulfilling them there is they're of no more use to us. When in reality <clears throat> Jesus came <clears throat> as what those things represented, and we are now finding the fulfillment and the full reality of what those things only represented. In other words, what's true of the Old Covenant and the Old Testament, <clears throat> uh, if seen in light of the truth, is all true. It just wasn't the exact image of that thing, and Hebrews talks about Jesus being the exact image of that. <clears throat> the problem with that is many Christians have believed that the New Covenant and the New Testament is as a completely different thing instead of the fulfillment of the, th of the Old Covenant. Completely different. <clears throat> and so they never really see what it was that God had in mind because they think that all of that is um, no longer valid for them. Well, it's just as valid, but it's more valid. Do you understand what I've said? By Christ, it's more valid. It's, it's just as valid, but it's more valid <laughs> than, than the shadow in the Old Covenant, which was valid. Um, but Jesus being the fulfillment of those. <clears throat> so Jesus didn't just come to start a new religion completely different premise. He came to set up the true reality of what all this was about. And as such, he came as the house of God concerning the tabernacle. <clears throat> he, he was the only true tabernacle that ever existed in the sense that <clears throat> he truly housed God in the manner that God had in mind not by the shadow, because the shadow never showed us the full picture. The shadow just showed a tent with God in it in the midst of a camp. And looking through that glass darkly, we don't see what Jesus is about to tell us here in John 14 as the true meaning of all of that. All right. So Jesus is that tabernacle. He is the tabernacle of God. And, but there is something greater, and that tabernacle relationship is put away at the cross where Jesus dies, and he dies as the tabernacle of God. <clears throat> and uh, when, you know, if someone dies, for example, if somebody died in the Old Testament or somebody died in the New, New Testament, such as Lazarus, if you raise them from the dead, that would be a miracle <clears throat> that would allow them to extend exactly what they were doing and who they were in the same manner. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he wasn't the same person. He now has a body of which we are that, 
and he was also risen <clears throat> in fullness of recognition that he is Lord now, and he's not Jesus of Nazareth walking around trying to just heal people. And basically the picture that most people have of, of Jesus in resurrection, that he, that he exists really just to help us and do all of this stuff and never treat him with the, the respect as Lord and, and as head of the body and all of those things. Completely different relationship came about. He's no longer just a tabernacle. He's the... He's the Lord of the temple. He lives in us. In the, as the tabernacle, the Father lived in him. In resurrection, he lives in us. In, as the tabernacle, his physical body <clears throat> for thir 33 and a half years was his tabernacle, but the Father lived in there and it was his body. In resurrection, we are the temple and he lives in us. <clears throat> now Jesus understood all of this, uh, obviously, because him and the Father and the Holy Spirit set it up from before the foundation of the world. <clears throat> Whatever Israel experienced of God eventually, um, you know, coming down and instead of just visiting someone, you know, or manifesting a miracle or, or just staying in heaven and doing something great, how, no matter how great that tabernacle being set down in the midst of God's people was, that, that was never what God wanted. Now, now, that would shock a lot of people. But that being a shadow, that's not what he wanted. And before the foundation of the world, they didn't think, well, I got an idea. Let's hang out with people and let's make a tent and we'll just come down there and live in the tent. Woohoo! And all three of them go, Woo, man, you're a genius. <laughs> but that's the way, you know, I mean, people hold the shadow so sacred when what God had in mind all along was that ultimately, well, first, Jesus would come as the tabernacle of God to be a picture of that in his individual person and in his resurrection. He would live in us, not just among us, you know. And so the, the tabernacle of the old covenant gives a wrong picture. Only because It's not wrong. It's not a clear picture. Let me say it like that. Because it doesn't really show him living in us. It shows him living among us. It's a shadow. Uh, the mirrors of the Old Testament, the old covenant days, the old, those old days, were made of brass. And you'd have to polish them up, but I don't know... You know, if you're, um, you know, they get a little moisture on them and stuff, they start turning real dark. And, uh, and that's what it means, you know, that we see in a glass darkly because it gets dark and you can't see the, the true thing. Like our mirrors where you see pretty much crystal clear, not their mirrors, you couldn't see it. And so they use that as an example of it's just fog. It's it's fogged up, and it's it's um, what is this stuff that builds up on it? Um, yeah, it just sort of gets tarnished. Yeah, <clears throat> and um, so um, <clears throat> the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit before the foundation of the world had a glorious plan that He would make mankind but mankind would eventually be his habitation. And so this, this tabernacle just pictured Jesus and to the Father and to, to the Holy Spirit when anybody did anything to the tabernacle or in it or of God or not of God or whatever else, he saw that as Jesus, though it wasn't Jesus. Do you understand? It was a shadow of Jesus. And he, but he, he took it serious. We didn't take it so serious. We here of the Old Testament, those of you who lived during that time period. <clears throat> We've got a few here. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> and so, uh, so the, because in their heart, before they ever made a world, much less a world where you could take and make materials to cover a, a tabernacle, <clears throat> They only saw one reality. I want Jesus living in you. I want you to become 
my temple. He didn't say my, you know, my rag doll or my, you know, puppet or, uh, you know, all the, you know, the, 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 the images that we get of Christ living in us. If, if I'm dead and Christ is living in me, then, then he's the hand that goes in there and I'm just a useless puppet, you know. Just ridiculous, you know. Just ridiculous. There, there, he, for Christ to live in you, there has to be a you. <laughs> and he, he kind of likes your personality, even if you don't, you know. And so, um, so we have this situation in John 14 where Jesus is talking about the Father, and and he he knows nothing but this these kind of reality. He knows the reality of this tabernacle, the reality of this cross, the reality of this temple. He knows that's what he's come for. He knows I am the tabernacle of God, and I have to explain that to you so that you'll see and build according to the pattern in the mount that you've seen of the tabernacle. That means us becoming the temple. <clears throat> and uh, Philip goes, oh man, it'd be so cool if you could just show us the Father. That would just be so cool. And Jesus, the tabernacle of God, is shocked and probably a little upset and whatever because he's, he's just, he says, you know, he, Jesus immediately says, don't you, you, don't you know who I am? I am the tabernacle of God. God dwells in me. If you've seen the tent, you've seen the inhabitor. Okay? So this is what he's trying to explain to them. And um, so, uh, and Jesus says, How sayest unto me, show you the Father? <clears throat> and so, um, Jesus is living more as the reality of a Jew at that point than anybody else because he knows God is right there. And he knows it beyond just <clears throat> God is a parasite on the inside of me. I was living and then he attached and somehow crawled in through my ear or something. You know, I invited him in my heart and he got there by way of, you know, my nose. And he attached to my heart or climbed in, you know, osmosis, he, and now he lives in me. Well, you know, I mean, some of the ideas that Christians have, they would never say it like that, but that's pretty much what they come up with, that that's how he lives in. No, he is, you know, and Jesus is about to explain this. He's about to explain that everything that you've been seeing has been the Father. How do you, how do you say unto me, show us the Father? He lives in me. And he's, he's stating this in a manner to make them understand that for him to live in you is not for, again, a parasite that lives in there that you never see any, you know, um, you know for example, a tapeworm, you know. You never see any fruit or reaction of, you never see it. You only see the results of it, which is draining you because it's eating all your food that goes in your stomach. <clears throat> And so there's a concept among most Christians that Christ lives in them without any reality. But Jesus is about to explain that the proof of that is, is that he's the one that's doing all the stuff through me. That's him. Okay. Well, there's not a whole lot of Christians that will say, well, you know, it's Jesus doing all the stuff through me. They'll go, well, you know, really, every once in a while he shows up, and it's usually in a service. What? <laughs> you know, in a church service, well, I got a word, you know, and so we deliver that word, and we go, God showed up in me, and I feel so good, man. You know, I, I you know, he's not wanting to just manifest gifts for your entertainment. He's wanting to live in you and through you and to produce, <clears throat> to produce his nature, the, the fruits of his nature through you. You see that? The fruits of his nature through you. <clears throat> All right. So um, 
Let's see. Let's just read um, verse 9 through 12. <clears throat> Jesus saith unto him, Have I been such a long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believe This verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. All right. So, um, if you notice the wording from verse 9 to verse 10, you begin to get the gist of Jesus' concept of being the tabernacle of God and is, and is the representation of what we should be as the temple of God. And he describes that in these words. <clears throat> he says, How sayest thou, show us the Father? And his next words are, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? All right. <clears throat> this is a completely different concept than you can see in the shadow of the, the tabernacle in the wilderness. That tent that was in the wilderness where God was in there and they all lived around it, there was no concept, at least none grasped, at least none grasped primarily by the majority of people, there was no concept of I live in you and you live in me. There was only the concept that he's over there in that tent and they weren't the tent. And they didn't see the incarnated Christ. They didn't see the reality that was to come. All they saw was in a, in a glass darkly, in a mirror darkly. <clears throat> and so Jesus is the only one who can truly explain himself because that was a picture of himself. You know, and every other explanation that does not come from the reality of why it came into existence in the first place is foolishness. And that includes all the teaching on the tabernacle that does not bring us in to his reality and his heart pertaining to these things. You know, just hanging on to teaching about a tent 4,000 years ago, really, or 6,000 years ago, you know, 4,000 years ago, really is not that cool. <laughs> you know, I mean, we can become like Pharisees and say, well, we know some stuff and make other people feel stupid. But that wouldn't be a manifestation of the true tabernacle or temple Christ living in us. That would be us gaining something to make other people look bad, and in making them look bad, I look better. <clears throat> All right, so he introduces the true foundation of the tabernacle. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? <clears throat> and folks, you cannot enter into any kind of true reality of the temple of God all you can do is learn doctrines and theories and theologies that changes nothing unless you comprehend I in you and you in me. That's what he's pointing to because he's talking as the tabernacle of God. And he's explaining that for those who will, will become after the cross the temple of God. All right, so then he adds to that, though. He says, the words that I speak I, uh, that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father. All right, so that's usually as much as we get out of that. <clears throat> Jesus is basically saying, according to our understanding, I don't want to speak of myself. I only want to talk about him. And that's a very Christian thing, but I don't know that it's a very Christ thing. I uh, I'm speaking... I want to speak about the Father. He's not using that thought in there at all. He's saying, have you, you, have you not known me? I, the words that I'm speaking unto you are the Father that dwelleth in me, because that's actually the rest of it, he doeth the works. Let's read the whole thing now uh, from that part. The words that I speak unto you, this verse 10, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. See, he's not talking about, I don't want to talk about myself, I want to talk about the Father. He's talking about, I am the 
tabernacle of God. And the words that I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you about this one, the Father. And to make sure that we got it, he says, that dwelleth in me. See, he didn't say, I want to, because Philip said, show us the Father. And he's saying, well, I've been showing you the Father. Amen? And he said, the words that I'm speaking unto you, I'm telling you this is not about me. This is not me. I'm just the tent through which he is working. It is not just the Father, folks. The Father specifically that dwells in me, and he doesn't leave it at that, that he just dwells in me, and really he's sort of, benign you know he's just in there and by faith I know he's in there no he says he does the works he's doing the work in me this 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 that you see being done through me I'm talking about the one doing it and he's in me and that's how these things are coming about all right all right now you have to understand a couple of things. Number one, he's not just trying to theor theologically bring us into great concepts. He is preparing us for a similar relationship that the tabernacle has with God, the temple will have to God, and the people that he's talking to are going to, uh, in his death and resurrection, they're gonna become that temple. So how will they know who they are, what they are, how to function, unless you make it according to the pattern that you've seen in the mountain? Jesus is that pattern. And the mount he was truly seen in is <laughs> the cross. But <clears throat> they, they, have no, they have no concept of this. And the proof of that is Philip going, well, just show us the Father. And he's going, you've been looking at him. But again... Jesus is not trying to communicate a doctrine on God dwelling in you either. He is trying to communicate a doctrine of God in you and you in him totally based on the relationship that the tabernacle had with God and Israel had with that tabernacle or we're supposed to and the temple of God. And that is... Not just that God is in you, but that you are that temple, the house of God, the, the dwelling place where he can manifest himself. Okay, well, that, that messes with the vast majority of Christianity right there because that says that being good and trying harder is not what it's about. Has anybody been good and tried harder and failed and failed and failed? Raise your hand if you have. Good, the vast majority of us. Okay, why would we be looking for something new, more? Not new, but more. Well, the only reason we'd look for more is because the old, uh -huh, the old is not working. And so we're open. All right, so Jesus is talking to, the, to his disciples now, and he's trying to communicate these things to them. <clears throat> um, and so his, he's trying to, he is trying to establish not theology per se, or doctrine the way most people understand it, but a belief system starting right now. It's like, the tabernacle of God has been with them, but they didn't get it, and he's starting right now. Okay, here's your new belief system. I am in, believest thou not? And he says this twice, by the way, in two verses. So you can understand that he's trying to communicate a belief system. I want you to believe according to this, because when the time comes that it applies to you, you'll be in a good position to receive it. But first, believe it about me. <laughs> I'm in the Father. The Father is in me. Okay? You are in Christ. Christ is in you. 
Again, if you make that just a doctrine, as most people understand doctrine, or a theological uh, set of, of you know, thoughts, it means absolutely nothing. By the way, I like your shirt. It means nothing. But if you take it as a belief system, it means everything. Can anybody see that? That it would literally radicalize your whole being because now, instead of being a Jew, you are a follower of Christ. Now, instead of, well, God accepts me when I do good and rejects me when I do bad, now God accepts me on the basis of Christ, not just on the basis of forgiveness, not just on the basis of Christ's work of bringing about forgiveness, but on the basis of Christ dwelling in me. And you can make that leap if you can find the truth of the tabernacle, if you find from the tabernacle himself speaking the belief system, <laughs> then when the time comes and you're in confusion when he's hanging on that cross and you don't get it, When the Holy Spirit comes, he begins to communicate, guess what? You remember all that stuff? And he said, Jesus said, look, I, the tabernacle, am going to go away. But the Holy Spirit's going to come, and he's going to take that which is of mine and show it unto you. Take that which is mine as the tabernacle and make it real in you as the temple of God. Is this any good? All right, and so um, so the last part of, no, the, the very first part of verse 10, believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Look at verse 11, first part. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Okay, so he's saying, I mean, why, why did... Why do these things repeat? Why does the Lord repeat himself like that? What's up with that? I mean, isn't one verily good enough? Isn't one Martha good enough? Does it have to be Martha, Martha? <clears throat> well, in this case, it's not a repeat. It is a change of venue. <laughs> It is, it is, there's just a slight difference between the two. The first one is, believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father's in me? First of all, it's a question. And I think that the, the conclusion he came to between that statement and the next verse was, no, I don't think they do believe this. I don't think they've even heard of it before. Okay? So, so Jesus changes it up. And it's sort of beautiful the way that he changes it. Verse 10, he says, believe me that I am in the Father. He's not saying believe the concept now. He's saying believe me and I'm telling you. I mean, in other words, it's not just a, a belief system thrown at you. It is Jesus saying, this is how I live. And I'm asking you to believe me concerning this. Well, they knew that he didn't lie and they knew he didn't cheat and he didn't steal and he didn't do, he wasn't anything like anybody else. <laughs> he was completely different. He was unselfish and constantly giving and to his own hurt and his own tiredness and his own detriment and his own hunger and all this kind of stuff. You read all the way through the gospels and you see that constantly that he's putting others first. So when he says, believe me that I am in the Father. Not, don't, believe this, don't believe the doctrine because you don't. Because you, really his wording was, believest thou this? And as I said, his conclusion must have been, no, you don't believe that. You don't even know it. You're just hearing it for the first time. So I'm asking you to believe me when I say this is the case okay and that's Jesus of course bringing us constantly into himself 
never just talking at us, never just trying to shape us up apart from him and our union with him and our being brought into him. <clears throat> All right, so believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Now let me make sure... <clears throat> um, Let's see here. I want to, I don't want to pass up anything in my notes, so <clears throat> I'm just going to read a little bit here. The tabernacle erected in the wilderness had an external... Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. All right. <clears throat> We're going to jump to uh, just a little example here, and that is this tabernacle in the wilderness, this top part up here, the covering that covered over it, the external covering was not linen or gold thread or, you know. The external covering, when you looked at that tabernacle, was what? Badger skin. Badgers. <laughs> Large wooden ones? No. <clears throat> no. This... Um, First of all, badgers were, were mean-tempered, and their, but their, more importantly, their fur was really coarse and rough. And when, you know, and they had to catch these badgers, kill them, sew them together, and make this thing so that the dwelling place of God was coarse and rough and was badger skin. The dwelling place of God. Okay. All right. So the tabernacle erected in the wilderness had an external covering of badger skin. This means that when you looked externally at that tabernacle, you saw a rough earthiness that covered a great secret. God himself. And you're going to have to go beyond your five senses to recognize him. You're going to have to get past because he'll intentionally cover himself with badger skin to throw you. And you'll, or he'll be born in a barn, you know. You know, with stinky animals and poop and, you know, all this stuff. Born in a barn. You know, he was, he was only in there for one day. Police came, looked in the door in the barn and said, you can't have a nativity scene here in public. You got to move on. <laughs> but that's that's the Lord. That's how He comes like that, and and only you know the the wise men are following a star, you know, and somebody says, well, okay, they were they were astrologers. I don't have a problem with that. They follow a star. Astrologers follow a star until it led them to Jesus. When it stopped over Jesus, then they went, hey, here's the truth. You know? And shepherds, shepherds. You know what shepherds take care of, don't you? Sheep. And you know where them sheep usually enter into the glorious city of Jerusalem through, don't you? Sheep gate. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> This stuff's starting to be tied together. We better run. <clears throat> All right. Um, so um, that tabernacle you saw with a rough earthiness covered a great secret. That great secret was that God himself lived inside. The badgers, because it took more than one badger, the badgers of whom the exterior consisted were dead. They were all dead. They died, therefore they no longer exist in that form of life. Badger life. That's right. But now they've changed forms. They have another kind of life on the inside of them. You get it? And that's Jesus' life. <laughs> huh? Huh? I mean, and is God sneaky or what? Because he doesn't want you going by your five senses. 
You know, I mean, I, I've known, and you can see it in history, you see it in the prophets, you see it all the way through. People go, well, you're not of God. They look at somebody and go, well, you're not of God because you don't appear the way that, you know, that I think you ought to. You know, you should walk around real humble. Oh, da-da-da-da, you know. Folks, there are slimy, slick people that do that stuff too. And they do it just to fool you. You know, Christ wants to live in you, not some fake thing, you know, but he wants it to be his life. He does, in other words, he wants it to be in you, badgers, badger skin, but not in, he's not living in the badger life. The badgers all died. And they got a new life. Okay? Uh, yeah. I'm glad y'all are figuring this out. <laughs> okay. Um, instead of an independent existence as a badger. <laughs> you, thought, you thought I was going to quit this little area and move on, didn't you? Um, they laid down that existence to become and exist as an external covering for the living God. The badger is now living as a tabernacle. <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> All right. So in the words of Jesus, I in you and you in me. Remember, believe us that? That's what he's talking about. I'm in the Father. But over here in verse 20, he says, I in you and you in me. Okay. We'll get to that. But. But in a sense, we're jumping ahead by some of this stuff. Because right now, he's just trying to explain his reality, knowing that it's going to become our reality, but on a greater scale. Because that little badger tabernacle is nothing compared to that temple. Solomon's temple. And that only comes in resurrection. All right. <clears throat> so... Where are we? In Jesus' words, I and you and you and me, he has explained the way of the new creation of Jesus' introduction of the true tabernacle pattern that he represented. And, and everything of that, the badger skin right down to everything, is screaming this reality. Most of the things that they worked with in, in that temple were called vessels or stuff like that. There was always, because it always pertained to being a vessel, but that's another thing, and you know, I really don't have to, I have time to really get into all of the furniture and all of that kind of stuff. <clears throat> but I think this right now is the most important, and Jesus clearly thinks that it's the most important thing. Maybe they have their books. You have your books. You don't have them with you. <laughs> Bunch of badgers. <laughs> Just kidding. A badge of disciples. Oh. <laughs> I object. Badgering the preacher. <laughs> Badgering the preacher. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Moving right along. If his disciples grasp this concept, then later they will receive John the Baptist's words He must increase and I must decrease. Or it grasped the Apostle Paul's word, stating, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, Christ liveth in me. All of these are scriptures verifying the way Jesus lived as tabernacle and the way we're supposed to live as temple. They're all verification of the Old, Old Testament picture shadowed in that tabernacle found to be not a shadow, but full reality in the incarnate Christ as tabernacle, and supposed to be found in his body, his resurrection body, the church. <clears throat> All right. So, um, 
So that's, the, that's his explanation of the first part of verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or else, believe me for the very work's sake. All right? So the second aspect of verse 11 also includes belief. Or else, believe me. You see that? It's still meant to be part of your belief system that Jesus Christ the Lord is trying to incorporate in disciples on their way to becoming the temple. Do we follow the Lord? If you follow the Lord, you're eventually going to be conformed to his image and become a temple. All right. Um, so, all right. Uh, let me make sure, let me read this again. Or else believe me for the very work's sake. All right, what is that? What's it talking about? Well, I'll spend probably the rest of my sessions talking about it. But Jesus, Jesus is only commenting on something he said in verse 10. He hasn't changed subjects. Believe me for the work's sake. What is the work? He says in verse 10, the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. You see that? It's not talking about miracles or whatever, and I probably have this down here. In saying this, the Lord is not talking about the kind of works, as in miracles, healings, deliverances. He is speaking concerning the source of what is done. He is basically explaining that whatever it is that comes forth from him, the source is God within and not out from himself as source. This is because he is living as the tabernacle of God. So the Lord is not pointing to specific works of a supernatural nature or even simple, uh, but, but even simple acts of kindness or patience as long as they find their source in God within and are not initiated by us out of some religious duty or desire to be Christ-like, to appear Christ-like. All right, I hope y'all got that. Because the works that he's talking about are not gifts. The gift of miracles, the gift of healings, the gift of, he's not talking about gifts. He's talking about the works produced by God within. Verse 10 verifies it and we'll, we'll, we'll show other examples of this, uh, but that's exactly what he's talking about and, it, and, and that stays in context with all of the verses around it, <laughs> which is good. You know, I mean, it would be like if you're talking to me and you say, you know, uh, school, you know, and I start talking about, well, you know, school of fish. I, you know, I remember you going, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to, you know, and then every time you said a word, I totally took it out of the context of what you're saying and I apply it to something I was taught somewhere else. That's what many Christians are doing constantly. They are you know, else believe me for the work's sake. In other words, believe me for the miracles. The miracles prove that I'm telling you the truth here. No. The works, he's, I mean, he defined it. The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. And he's not talking about miracles. He's talking about the very manifestation of the Father, that, that, that those things are the Father. All right, so in saying this, the Lord is not talking about, okay, I said that. Um, having said all of this, it should help us to see that Jesus' words of, or else believe me for the very work's sake, is his reference to the Father, listen, get ready, the Father that dwelleth in me. The works are, are defined as the Father who dwelleth in Because he's saying he doeth the work. So they are defined by a indwelling God that is living inside of me instead of me trying to do works. And, and everything in the New Testament, you know, it's just ridiculous. Everything in the New Testament says don't, you can't earn, not of works of righteousness that we've done, not of works of the law. You know, some people say, well, it's not by works of the law. So they try to do works of righteousness. But the same Bible says not of works of righteousness that we have done. So we go, well, I, I'm not under the law. 
I'm too busy trying to establish my own righteousness <laughs> to be under the law. What? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. And, and you know, most people, I don't know, why, it's like they can't see through all of that. You just go, you know, ultimately, was it the Father in you or was it Christ in you? Well, no. Okay, well then, then you're off, you know. And then that makes people mad and they want to call you names and kill you. Yeah. Righteous indignation that kills. <laughs> Folks, we should be happy that God has made us his temple and will dwell in us and perform the things that we cannot do. That should make us happy. That shouldn't make us mad. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get it. I mean, we, because all it is saying is give the Lord all the glory. Oh, well, let's give the Lord the glory, but not all the glory. You know, I mean, I seek first the kingdom of God, or I seek the kingdom of God, but I don't seek it first. You know, I mean, I had somebody tell me that. You know, they were, they were going off on, no, oh, I, I've got this problem and this and that and everything. And I said, well, you know, are you seeking first the kingdom of God? He said, man, I am seeking the kingdom. I said, I think what I asked you, I said, are you seeking it first? And he went, well, now that you put it like that, probably not. <laughs> the more I talk, the more I understand why people <laughs> <laughs> makes perfect sense. Bring it. I deserve it. <clears throat> All right. Um, let me make sure here. <clears throat> okay, now all this is very important to understand if we're going to rightly divide the next verse. So many have misinterpreted the words of Jesus in, in the next verse because they have not kept with the context of the scripture nor continued upon the line of thought that our Lord is setting forth. All right. <clears throat> Let me see here. I guess we, we can go a little further. All right, what the Lord's going to do <clears throat> is he's going to make a radical change with this next verse. We've, we've started in verse 9 tonight, talking about um, uh, Philip asking, about God. I want to see God the Father and Jesus only comprehending himself as the tabernacle of God is going, what are you talking about? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. All right. So he's, he's gone on that line through all the way through 9 and 10 and 11, verse 12. He is going to make a leap, huge leap, okay? And there he is, doing those two-word things again. Verse 12, verily, verily, not just verily, folks. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. All right. What's the leap that he made from those other verses that, he, that he's manifesting here in verse 12? Raise your hand if you know. Okay. Well, I'm not going to... I'm not going to embarrass anybody. The leap is all this time he's been talking about the tabernacle and him, and now he's leaping over here to the temple because he's talking about them and they're not the tabernacle. They're going to be the temple. And he's preparing them. Let's read it again. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. He is totally now referring to them, and he's referring to them in relationship to the same works that he did, which works are what? It's God in me. So guess who it's talking about? The temple. 
He's talking about the soon coming temple that will happen after his death on Calvary. Okay? Now this is, this is big stuff to him and to God the Father and to the Holy Spirit. This is incredibly huge stuff because Jesus is, is the living example of what's coming, but it's going to be greater. Right? Because it still will be Jesus, but it'll be Jesus in all of us. All of the living stones, or as a body, all of the members of the body. And now, instead of him just, you know, because the uh, example up to this point has been Jesus is just talking to disciples standing out here, and he's going, you know, the tabernacle is talking to them, and he's saying, you know, I'm this way, and the way that I live is as the tabernacle of God. God lives in me, and I live in him, and if you've seen me, you've seen him. And he's communicating all of that to little dudes, to disciples. But now, now, in verse 12, he is making a huge leap. He's talking to them of what they will become if they will believe in what? Me, he said, if you believe in me. And then how that verily, verily I say unto you, uh, he that believeth on me, okay, and, and I think that that word is in, can be translated either way, but I think the proper word is in me. In, in fact, most of the time when it talks about believing on Jesus or in Jesus, the actual literal Greek word is to believe into him. Now, I didn't make that up. Scholars that know the Greek but don't know God will tell you that's exactly how that's supposed to be translated. All right. So if these little dudes will believe into the tabernacle of God and the way that he functions, then the works that he does will be doing over here as temple. But you can't be a little dude all your life. You can't be just a little individual disciple running around and, and, and sadly, sadly, the, the modern day church explanation of being a disciple is simply following Jesus by going to church, reading some stuff, uh, learning about miracles, learning to pray for people. Folks, the Jews knew all of that stuff before Jesus ever came. They knew how to pray for people. They saw miracles all the time, way more than most people in the church see it. They were used to miracles. Read the Old Testament. They had deliverances. God raised them from the dead. God saved them from their enemies. All the stuff we claim, this is the new covenant. Well, they had it all in the old covenant. Then what the heck is the new covenant? <laughs> Come on. You know, I mean, it's like we got to wake up to some of this stuff. Many people who say they're disciples are not really, you know, Jesus said, if anyone wants to follow after me, if anybody wants to be my disciple, take up the cross, deny yourself, and come after me. Well, the first requirement is, number one, a cross. Number two, a denial of yourself. <laughs> so why do people get upset with this? If that is the actual first words of Jesus to people who want to follow him. He doesn't say, follow me, then take up the cross, then deny yourself. He says, take up the cross, deny yourself, or maybe it's the other way around on that one. But the last one is, and follow me. <laughs> you know. So if you just took Jesus literally, I mean, meaning he's my Lord, these words, if I was alive during the day that he was here and I heard him speak, and I said, I'm going to follow you. I would listen to what he's saying, and I would follow that. I wouldn't just go join another group that says, okay, all you've got to do is do what the Jews always did. Is anybody catching what I'm saying there? You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't just go, okay, then this is following Jesus. 
No, only Jesus can define what following Jesus is. And here's the bottom line. I'm not, I am not pushing, <laughs> I am not pushing the requirements of following Jesus. That's not what I'm trying to emphasize. I am not pushing the cross, and I'm not pushing deny yourself. I'm pushing follow Jesus or, or go after Jesus. And if you do, if you really do, if you did back in those days, you'd end up with a cross and a self-denial theology, if you will, or, you know, I mean, you just would. Well, if you did that today, you'd end up with the same thing. You wouldn't be off in some, you know, you know. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> And, and the only reason why I'm saying all that is just real simple. Do I love Jesus? Do I really want to follow him? And do I really want it to be according to the word? Or I, do I want someone to pick and choose scriptures that please me and pet my flesh and make me feel better about being carnal or something? You know, and the answer is, that's up to each individual. I can't, I, I can't change anyone's heart. I can't change anyone here. And in fact, my emphasis lately has just been off talking about the way I see stuff. It's the way Jesus saw it. You hear me over in Philippians, that's the way Paul saw it. That's the wording that I use a lot more now. Well, it seems to me that Paul just saw it this way. I say that now. Because it's not my teaching. I didn't dream it up. I didn't conceive of it. I heard, in this case, I heard Jesus say, this is what you do. And I said, I love you, Lord. And if that's it, then that's it. You know, I mean, you know, it'd be like Mary, you know, somebody asked you to marry him. And they said, yeah, but we're going to live a hard life. I don't really have this or that. And we're going to have to live in, you know, this and bad situation here and this and that and you know so before before you answer yes to my proposal you know are you going to be okay with that well in the movies they always go yes i just want to be with you oh my god yes a thousand times and the music fades and and wow Oh, to live in fairy tales. But to follow Jesus is going to have some stuff. And it's not all miserable. It's not, it's not death as most people see it. I mean, you know, um, you could say that the death we die is a death to selfishness. Does that really hack anybody off? Well, only the selfish. <laughs> You know, I mean, you know, they're the only ones who don't want to hear that. You know, and if Jesus said to them, well, you know, you're going to have to forsake all the things that you've been selfish for and greedy over. If they said no, Jesus would say, well, it's fine. I mean, Jesus, you know, the, the rich young ruler, you know, you've heard the story, the rich young ruler. I mean, my God, my God, and my God. Ladies, can you get anything better? He's rich, he's young, he's a ruler. I mean, this dude's got it all. So Jesus ought to really be taken with him. So he comes up and he says, you know, can I follow you? I want to follow you and all this stuff. And and uh, he says, well, you need to go, you know, sell all your stuff, da 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 do this and that. And he says, well, I've done that from my youth up, kept the law, you know, I've done that. And he says, okay, well, then you need to go give away everything you got. And he went away sorrowful. Okay, well, he wasn't in love. You understand what I'm saying? You know, if you, if you love, then you can go through a lot of stuff. If you don't love, you'll quit going through stuff or you won't want to go through it anymore. You know, it's just too hard, you know. Really? Is it? Is it really just too hard? <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just thinking as a guy right now, well, if it's really just too hard, then we probably weren't meant to be together. You know? Yes, it's hard, 
yes, there's tears, but it's not too hard. Sila. <laughs> All right. Uh, All right, so, so, boy, I really, we need to stop. Are we supposed to have a break? We're, take a break. Let's stop. My Lord. What is wrong with this guy? <laughs>